Hello everyone. This is Tasma Valam Ahona, currently working as a research intern at Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. Welcome to our today's show. And this is a segment of Strategic Talk. BIPSS is organizing a series of video podcasts where we try to understand what do the experts think of some of the recent issues. And in today's segment, we have Dr. Lailufer Yasmin, Professor, Department of International Relations, Dhaka University as our guest. She has expertise in several sectors, including Bangladesh's foreign policy, regional politics, the Indo-Pacific region, and specifically China's Belt and Road Initiative. So ma'am, welcome to our show today, and thanks a lot for coming today. So in our discussion today, uh, it, it will be on the competing strategies, China and the West, as we all know that this is the issue that has been brewing slowly yet strongly. So I would like to ask you first, how would you view the ongoing strategic rivalry between the China and the West and in particular US and China? Um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, in terms of uh, strategic rivalry between the West and China, uh, or uh, more specifically between America and China, um, I would say that this is something that is portrayed uh, heavily by by the Western side, uh, specifically by the uh, uh, by America than by China. Um, why I say this because um, you know uh, China's rise has been mainly in the economic sector. Uh, yes, they are also developing their military arsenal, but uh, um, if we look back in history, China has never been an expansionary power. Um, but uh, with the rise of uh, economic might of China, uh, that has certainly unnerved America and um, uh, many of the European countries. While all the European countries do not uh, uh, agree uh, with the uh, United States of America on this, uh, but uh, a good number agrees that China is going to be a potential threat. And now, uh, starting from UK and many other countries are also devising their own Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, so the uh, rivalry, strategic rivalry that is shaped around uh, having a rules-based international order in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, but as uh, we have seen in a number of, uh, you know, articles um, um, produced in foreign policy and other uh, such uh, renowned uh, international journals. Um, a number of uh, American scholars and um, in general Western scholars have asked that whose rules-based order are we talking about? Uh, specifically, Stephen M. Walt, he has a question that uh, uh, whether uh, people uh, in, the, in the other side of the world, they want American rules-based order or uh, who says that uh, China does not want a rules-based order or uh, what if others want a China's rules-based order. Uh, so what is the uh, significance of rules-based order? It is simply from China's perspective, no interference in internal affairs of another country uh, and uh, China wants international trade and commerce to flow uninterruptedly. So basically America, what America wants, what China wants, they converge at, at some point. Uh, but uh, when it is translated as a strategic rivalry, it may sound uh, something very, uh, uh, something very um, uh, serious, uh, um, like uh, as some people uh, tend to term it as uh, the onset of a new Cold War, or, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, you know, this may have uh, other implications for uh, different countries. Uh, but here, uh, I've also seen a number of scholars have also argued that this cannot be called a Cold War because um, um, China does not want to disrupt the, uh, the international trade and commerce. China does not want to, uh, uh, or not in a mission to export revolution, just the way USSR, former Soviet Union, uh, pursued its uh, international uh, policies, its foreign policies. So there's a fundamental difference between the way Cold War happened uh, from 1945 to 1990 and the kind of rivalry or competition uh, that is going on between America and China. So there we need to uh, understand that many Chinese and American companies are working together just as much as many American, uh, sorry, many uh, Indian and Chinese companies are working hand to hand together. Therefore, it is a. It would be a. Uh, you know, it would be like uh, putting too much stress by calling it a strategic rivalry, and that's how a military-industrial complex grows, uh, flourishes, and it makes other countries uncomfortable who are asked to 
choose between either China or America. Many countries are very uncomfortable in making this choice the way they did it during the Cold War period. Sure, ma'am. Definitely, this actually creates an uncomfortable situation in this region specifically. But as this uh, issue of chaos, there is a possibility and people are expecting it that it might happen at some point. So what could be the possible major points of friction if it happens someday? Uh, you mean uh, strategic rivalry or war? Might be a Cold War someday. People are expecting it. Okay. Uh, no, I, here I, I disagree a little bit that uh, some people are imposing it, like uh, if you read foreign affairs and some other, uh, you know, uh, this kind of journals who have a very hawkish uh, way of you know interpreting China American relationship, but on the ground this is it is not like that on the ground uh, and some people also tend to focus on China's old four years that is the way China is pursuing very forceful diplomacy but any country pursuing its national interest will be doing that um, so therefore I find it a very hawkish observation that it will turn into a cold war because uh, let's face it uh, China's economy is as robust. Uh, is, is, is very robust compared to America's economy. And if you go to a Chinese city, if you go to an American city, you would see the relative decline. So America, and also one other fundamental area that many scholars are missing, that in China, there is a domestic consensus uh, for China to pursue a, a global policy that they have, they see themselves as a, a center, as the center of the earth, as Middle Kingdom. Uh, uh, on the other hand, in America, this domestic consensus is extremely absent. So if there is no domestic consensus on America's global role, therefore America's foreign policy is going to falter. So first, they have to take care of things at home. They want to create a domestic consensus around how America is going to engage internationally um, and then perhaps, um, you know, go about it. Okay, so ma'am, uh, as you said that, the, uh, what about the situation in Indo-Pacific? Are we expecting a more militarized Indo-Pacific or can that eventually affect or what effect can it create on the South China Sea specifically? Yeah, this is this is a very interesting question because um, many uh, uh, while uh, a segment of scholars are arguing that uh, what happened in Afghanistan is America's defeat, but they are not seeing the repercussions of that, that it is not America's defeat, rather it is America's attempt uh, to uh, uh, sort of uh, prioritize another area which it thinks more important because America's withdrawal for, from Afghanistan, it was on the way and it was uh, from Obama administration to uh, Trump administration, they were all committed to a complete withdrawal. It was a very prudent decision for uh, the Biden administration to do it at, at, uh, at a point when, you know, it will uh, uh, it will help uh, Biden administration to commit more uh, time and energy in the Indo-Pacific region, because we can see how the vice president, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, Miss um, Kamala Harris, uh, she has already started uh, her first uh, official tour, uh, and that was focused on in the Pacific region. So America wants to um, give this message to its allies and to the specifically to the in the Pacific region that its commitment to in the Pacific region is solid and it is the priority area, and therefore it does not want to remain engaged or waste energy uh, in other areas uh, of the world. So uh, it will certainly militarize this region more than uh, it happened. Uh, and um, therefore uh, we can expect that um, that situation over there. However, um, even today in 2021, I, I believe um, I, I will see in my lifetime or maybe in your lifetime, you will see it, uh, that wars, uh, conventional warfares, although they're coming back, but it is, uh, it is uh, very unlikely for China to get engaged in conventional warfare in the manner that happened in 20th century or before that. So I don't see any possibility of direct warfare bringing breaking between China and other parties. But ma'am, uh, in this whole scenario, China definitely holds a power. China definitely holds a power to change the entire dynamics because they have, they are in a position on that. They are such a, in such a position. So, and as we know that you have spent time in Beijing as a research fellow. So in, on that context, how do you consider the role of China should be played as a global power in this specific uh, situation? 
uh, should be played? Okay, uh, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, in fact, uh, um, when I was there, which was like long time back in 2005, 2006, I have seen that how the whole society uh, was uh, you know gearing up to take up uh, this global role because um, in 2006, um, uh, Beijing Olympic was. Uh, you know, scheduled to happen. And during that time, I've seen that uh, uh, even taxi drivers, they were learning English while driving taxi. They had their headphones on and they're learning English. Um, yeah, young kids, uh, especially in the, in the middle class and the upper middle class, especially the flat that I used to, um, I used to leave, uh, I've seen that uh, mothers were prompting their kids to speak with me in English. So a generation who, know, uh, uh, who knows both Mandarin and English that is emerging. So so China's soft power right <clears throat> this is something that has been very less spoken about that China uh, is preparing for a global role with both its hard power its economic power as well as you know its soft power this is something rather make the world more worried than you know any other any other issues and wherever china is going um, they are learning the about the custom of that country they are learning about the language of that country so they are truly preparing themselves for a uh, for uh, uh, appearing in global leader. Um, and in this context, I'd like to mention the role of the Confucius Center and how Chinese are speaking better Bengali than we do, because in our Bengali language, the way we talk, it is mixed with English and in Bangla, but uh, it's not what they are doing. And even with, from my Sri Lankan friends, I've, I've learned that um, they speak better Sinhala than the you know, native Sinhala. So wherever they're going, they're adopting and they're learning their practices. It's a reflection of Chinese um, uh, sort of uh, philosophy of yin yang, that uh, unity in diversity. On the other hand, the Western countries, they believe in singularity, westernization uh, is equal to modern, modernization. That's not what, um, you know, a Chinese, uh, a part of Chinese philosophy. And that is why China's model is getting more popularity in different parts of the world than the Western model gradually. And if this model is, you know, backed up by money, then its appeal increases. And that is why I think that China's, um, uh, uh, you know, taking up a global role uh, very soon, uh, very, you know, in their future uh, will, will not be very unlikely. However, there is one area where China still lacks is that whether it will it will be interested to take part in uh, mitigating political crisis in different parts of the world? One of the uh, you know uh, uh, important uh, sort of uh, characteristics of the Cold War was either United States of America or former Soviet Union they would act as a responsible power in the sense that we would know where the location of power. Uh, uh, power is, and um, in that way, they would try to mitigate certain crises, international crises, but China has not yet shown that particular kind of tendency, except for in the areas of climate change. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, when that troll is fulfilled, China would truly emerge as a global power. And ma'am, in terms of being worried, as you mentioned in your last speech or last segment, that we should worry about Bangladesh in this scenario because what is your opinion on the current state of Bangladesh and China? What should be our role on this Belt and Road Initiative as a signatory? Because it will affect us whatever China does or any other party does here. Yeah, for Bangladesh, in fact, uh, we always argue that what is happening globally certainly affects us, but for us, what is happening regionally directly affects us. That is, India-China rivalry is our first area of concern than America-China rivalry. Uh, so China's increasing investment, uh, increasing you know, presence in, in Bangladesh has worried many in, in India. But at the same time, we have to look into the fact that uh, Bangladesh is emerging as a power to be reckoned with. It is often called as an emerging middle power. Um, and it has uh, this bargaining capacity where it has learned to say no. So wherever uh, we, an example would be uh, you know, saying no to China on the Shona the uh, deep sea port project. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it has also said yes. For example, uh, in uh, our first uh, deep sea port is, be uh, is being in Matabari is being constructed with Japanese assistance. But on the other hand, on the CTG Bay terminal, it is divided into 19 components and divided in a manner so that no one country can you know, control it. So Bangladesh has been able to give this, send this message to both India, China, and rest of the world that uh, Bangladesh uh, wants China as a friend, but certainly Bangladesh also want 
other countries as friends as well. So in Bangladesh, in the diplomatic circle, one phrase is emerging and uh, gaining popularity recently is growth without enmity, that Bangladesh has been able to show to the rest of the world that growth can happen uh, without being inimical to any other countries of the world. And Bangladesh has been a prime example of that. It has friendship with uh, India, it has friendship with China, it has friendship with you know any other great powers that you name. So therefore, I would see that uh, China's uh, engagement in Bangladesh, um, well, as Honorable Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina uh, um, said uh, during the WEF um, you know, conference back in 2019, that we sign deals by looking into the details of the deal. So therefore, Bangladesh is cautious, and, but at the same time, Bangladesh wants not only China, but other countries also as a friend. But of course, Bangladesh has attained that strategic autonomy to say no to um, any other countries of the world. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. And I hate to admit that this is a rather vast topic to be discussed in a time frame of 15 minutes. So I wish I, we had more time to discuss this issue with you. So thank you so much, ma'am, for lending us some time to have this issue-based discussion. And we look forward to have you more on our next episodes. So that was all for today's episode of Strategic Talk. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us. And see you all in the next episode. Goodbye. Uh, thank you, too, for having me here. Goodbye. Thank you, ma'am.